you know, this whole journey started for me and Wayne, or for Wayne and I in uh, fall of 1988. So it's 32 years of my life <laughs> doing this at this point, which is just astonishing to me. Um, so, yeah, now, now you know, just getting into the static X recorded history is long enough. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing that the time flies by like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, you know, I I turned 54 in June. And so, you know, it seems like time is speeding up in that sense, you know. Um, better enjoy me today, you know. But, but that being said, yeah, it, it does – it does fly by so fast and especially you know when you're touring um and traveling as much as we did last year like i would i would love that last year was so incredible that i'd love to do it all over again you know because it it just it went by so quick is there is there one show that uh sticks out uh the most uh of the of the previous year, you know, there's there's really two shows. I mean, they all stood out. It, it, the response was overwhelming, and certainly things like, you know, playing in Ukraine, playing in Russia, my first time in Australia, a lot of the European tour. I mean, you know, being in those places for the first time. But I would tell you the two shows that really, and and plus playing playing in front of my family my my parents both my parents are still alive and they're you know 80 years old so and they, they thought i would never get to do this again so that was amazing but the show in atlanta where wayne's youngest sister amy came out and and the family has wayne's family is um not only supportive but they're active in this. You know, we don't, nothing is done without their approval. Um, so Amy came to the Atlanta show, and that was about the fifth show in. And it wasn't that we weren't having fun, but, you know, you, you just, we, we all felt like kind of a pressure about it that we didn't know, but the, the shows were enjoyable. They were going great. But then, it, you know, then we realized when Amy came out, that was the first big step for us where, you know, there was some pressure re- relieved and, and she had a blast and we had a blast and it was just kind of a, but yet still a bittersweet time hanging out with her and then a a few weeks later we played in grand rapids and wayne's and amy flew in for that and wayne's whole family was there and you know we're we're the whole band was more like brothers anyway our families all know each other uh you know we we always check up on each other in that sense but just having Wayne's family come out to that show meant a lot and just being able to talk to them. And those, those two shows were just such a huge emotional release that, that I would tell you if anything stood out in me then. And have your parents always approved of uh, your, um, uh, your musical goals? Yeah. Well, the, I, I come from a, and we all come from musical families. Um, my mom, my mom was a drummer when she was younger. She's, you know, our church pianist. Um, my dad played drums for a while in school band. Both my sisters played instruments. So uh, now, when I was a teenager in my in my early twenties in cover bands. I don't think they viewed it as anything more than a hobby, but I knew, you know, um, I knew that I knew that I wanted to do something different and I wanted to do original music. And I think that confused them for a while, but, but then once Los Angeles came into play, then they kind of, 
they kind of jumped on board. And uh, when you talk about, when you say Los Angeles, you're talking about uh, it was you and Wayne that uh, made the trek to, uh, from Chicago to uh, Los Angeles, right? Yeah. So when you're, when you and Wayne, uh, you know, uh, left the, uh, the comforts of your, uh, your, the nest, uh, that that's when they realized that, uh, you weren't messing around. Yeah. I, I think there was, when we were in Chicago, probably the last year to year and a half, I think that they realized we were serious about it. But also, you know, Chicago at that time, I mean, there was a music scene and, and everything there, but the the record labels weren't there. You know, it was still uh, New York and Los Angeles at that point. Um, so, yeah, when... I think people think that, you know, we were brave for trying or something. I think it was more like we were terrified of not trying, <laughs> you know, it was more acting out of fear of, of not trying, not attempting, you know, we knew we had to go to where the labels were at um, because effectively at that time, you know, hard rock wasn't a big thing in Los Angeles either. That was the, the you know, 1993, 94 in Los Angeles. And the, the glam thing was kind of played out. The, the grunge thing was actually for its end. And, and Los Angeles bands were figuring out a new path and trying new things. So, but what, you know, hey, it was warm out there. And Chicago was freezing cold when we left. <laughs> Seemed like a place to go. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you uh, what were some of the more difficult adjustments you had to make, but it, it sounds like you, uh, you 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 fit right in. Uh, it, you know, it kind of it took a while. Um, there was, you know, we got out there and there was really no. We left our family, so there was no support. You know, um, and also we really went out there and started from scratch. I mean, we had we had some songs and we had a new direction, but it wasn't established yet. Um, you know, we were still a year to a year and a half away from starting to write the songs that became Wisconsin Death Trip. Um, yeah, so and that, that was probably early '95, late '94, early '95 when we started that process. So uh, yeah, it was there were a lot of challenges, and you know we didn't go out there with very much money. I didn't even have a credit card at the time. I had a, a credit card for phones, and that was it. So it was it, the first year was kind of a mad scramble, and then eventually uh, my oldest sister moved out there, and uh, Wayne and I and my oldest sister got an apartment together, and then that's when we started writing the things that became Death Trip. Uh, five years later, that album came out. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, yeah. That album. That, that album put you guys on the map and blew up, I, I imagine, pretty quickly. Uh, how soon after its release did it seem like uh, you were onto something? Because, you know, not everything flies. Well, I remember going into, I had, I'd been working in record stores and been a reporter, a billboard reporter for uh, music charts at one point in Chicago. So, I had a pretty good understanding of the music industry. My sister had worked for uh, an A and R director at one point, so we had a pretty good idea of how the industry worked. And I remember hearing we'd been out for a couple of months, and I heard how many we were getting all this incredible response. 
And, you know, a couple of the songs have been played on national radio stations. And this was months before the album came out. And then a week or two before the album actually came out, we had just a couple of days off in Los Angeles. And I heard how much we actually shipped. And, and it was so shockingly low that I thought, oh, okay, we gave it a shot, you know. Um so I was scared to death about that, but then we sold something. It was something ridiculous. We sold sixty or seventy percent of the albums we shipped in the first week, and and it wasn't a huge number, but but we almost sold out that first shipment. So the second shipment of the album tripled, and then I thought, okay, it's going to do well, you know, this is a really good stepping stone to the next album. I don't know if it's going to go gold, but it's it's a really good start for effectively an independent label band that got signed to Warner Brothers. I mean, we were an experiment for them. But yeah, I think, you know, on the Megadeth tour after our first Ozfest, and we were moving 10, 12,000 units a week, that was when we realized, oh, okay, this is this is going far beyond what we ever imagined. And you did come from an era of record sales, like you were just talking about. How weird is the industry now compared to then? Because you're talking well, about. Tw- Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, it's no, we, yeah, you are talking what 20, 20, 21 years ago now. Um, oh, it's so totally different that almost everything I learned at that point in time doesn't apply. Um, there are certain things I like about it. I like the kind of retro, uh, you know, we put out, um, there's a vinyl pressing of this and of course, you know, CD hard copies of it. And I like that, you know, I'm, I'm from the kiss generation, you know, the seventies. So, um, I love seeing that stuff, you know, seeing the hard copy and picking it up and it's a gatefold, you know, I mean, it's just such a cool thing to me. Um, That being said, you know, I do have a grasp of streaming numbers and, and I'm I'm aware of what stuff to look at. Um, I don't know. Yeah. It's weird. I don't know that it's any less satisfactory because the, the response is, for this album, I mean, it's been pretty overwhelming for us. So, you know, you just adapt, I guess. Now, the new album, uh, uh, Project Regeneration Volume 1, is that right? Yes. Uh, it, it's a really good album. Uh, I've been listening to it a lot. Uh, you, you must be stoked that it's finally out. You know, because we had it done and we had the artwork and we had all these concepts together. And then, you know, with the pandemic hitting like it did, manufacturing manufacturing was shut down, shipping was shut down. So even if we got it pressed and printed and everything, you know, everything was just delayed so much that, yeah, it was – when Death Trip came out, there was this – you know, we were younger. It was this overwhelming excitement. Oh, it's record release day. And with this, it, it kind of was more of a relief, to be honest, <laughs> because because of everything that had come up in the few months prior to that. But, yeah, that being said, yeah, still exciting. The response has been overwhelming. So, um, yeah, no reason not to be excited about it. Did it meet your projected sales goals? I didn't have any expectations there. Um, just simply because kind of helps me in life in general is if you have no expect expectations of something, um, generally you tend to be a little more content and satisfied with things. Um, so I didn't know. And, and I, I mean, I, I had no idea, uh, you know, five, six years ago, I, I I really, and especially after Wayne died, I had no idea that anything like this would ever happen again. So, um, you know, everything about it is, is a blessing, even the struggles, because 
it, it's, it's the response has been so over, overwhelming. I know that's kind of a vague answer for you, but but really, I mean, you know, it, it was it's an emotional record for us. I can tell you that, you know, um, and we're just really glad that that people have uh, and honored and humbled that people have grabbed onto it like they have. The super catch you bring you down is the new single. Um, what is the response being like, and how do you go? How do singles go about being decided upon? Really a, a band decision, you know. Um, Hollow was decided on because uh, it just it had a good energy. It was driving. It kind of had, oddly enough, with all the programming and everything and the keyboards in it, it's still got like kind of a punk feel, but it's got this choppy industrial vocal at the point. It, it just kind of encapsulated what the reunion was about, which was looking to the past a little bit, being a little bit nostalgic about that, but also looking ahead. Um, but then for all these years, you know, we felt it was really important to, you know, that kind of came together with the video and having some B-roll footage of Wayne and it, it, it fit uh, it fit a theme, a nostalgia theme, and you know that's how the video came about. And um, for "Bring You Down" was, you know, again we had some B-roll footage from other videos and some stuff that we had shot that was new. And um, "Bring You Down" kind of, you know, it's it, "Bring You Down." It reminds me of Fix a little bit, you know, and so I think that's it. I mean, they all kind of throw back to the first album in a sense, but they're the first two albums, and you know, so we sit down and discuss them, and that's it. It's just kind of a, you know, I would tell you, you know, Zero has a very good vision of where to take this thing and and what to release, and that's a huge help. You know, how difficult was it to leave the band uh, uh, when you did? Had it lost its way? I don't know that it lost its way so much. It's just we did so much touring in those early years, and as close as we are, you know, you put that many people on a bus for. I think at one point, the first two albums we had done six. Uh, out of six years of being out, we had played like five and three quarters years of shows, you know, like it, it was something crazy like that. And um, the relationships were strained. So, yeah, it was it was hard to leave it um, because I hadn't known anything else for 15 years. But then I, I realized, you know, for my own mental health, eventually, I, and I tried a couple other projects after that, but then I found out it was good to get away from it. Um, I don't know that I was enjoying playing drums at the time. Uh, eventually, I went back and I became a, a drum teacher uh, during that time, and I, I rediscovered how much I liked the artistry of drumming and and you know, how fun it was to teach somebody, you know, a, a beginner, just basic concepts of drumming, especially when you see that light bulb go on above their head, you know, that became an exciting thing. And it kind of rejuvenated the fun I have in just how much enjoyment I take from, from playing drums. But I also, during that time, you know, got to, I sat down with computers and learn software and recording during that time so that that helped in the long run um yeah the the relationships were strained but you know the absence helped in the long run i eventually you know with tony and koichi i just realized just how much i missed those guys and it wasn't just about playing shows they're just genuine guys to hang out with you know um so yeah while it was hard i also kept myself i i didn't 
contact any of the guys during that time. Um, it was only after the band ended when Tony and I got back in contact and Koichi and I had, had uh, texted each other a few times and, and um, while it was hard, I didn't want to interfere with anything they did after I left. I didn't expect them to stop or anything like that. It wasn't, you know, it just seemed like it was a time to move on. And and it's it's hard. I think people think because a band has chemistry together that those relationships are always just the most perfect thing. But I also think, well, you understand it, having been in a band, you know, um, we're we're all artists, and therefore, you know, we're sensitive. We can be fragile at times. All of us are like this, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, it's it's work just to to keep to keep up the basic relationship going, you know, and any kind of friendship or relationship or whatever. It's it's work. It's give and take, and it takes both people. And you you really can't approach any relationship with the idea of what am I getting from this, you know? But yeah, it's um it's tough, and at times you do have to say, okay, this isn't benefiting either one of us, and and maybe I'm part of the issue too. Maybe I need to step away, you know? Uh, and it's it's tough, but then if you can come back to those relationships later on, that's always that's always a positive. That's a process everybody should invest in though. You know, forgiveness goes a long way. Unforgiveness is like it really if you kinda of harbor that, you it's really like taking poison and hoping the other person dies, you know? I mean Exactly, exactly. Because Yeah. And but the reality is that eventually you just get to a point where you think to yourself you know, and it was important for me to talk to Tony about that when the first time I saw him face to face, and we weren't talking about this was about a year before Wayne died, and Tony was out with Soulfly, and I felt it was really important to let him know that you know I I had spent that time getting over myself. I wasn't going to hold a grudge against him, you know. It it wasn't that became. And it also poisons the memories of the good times that you actually did have, which was a majority of the time with Static X. So it was just important to move past that. But uh, I'm sure you've discovered, you know, it's a process. Some days you get up and you're like, man, I'm just going to hate that guy all day. <laughs> then you, you know, you got to, you have to say to yourself, well, that there's nothing positive that's going to come out of that. So. You know, let's move forward. Yeah. I couldn't find you on Facebook. H have you blocked me or are you just not plugged into it? I am a social media shunner. <laughs> I was I was on for a while. Um I like talking to people. I like in talking to people face to face. It's just a more personal thing. Social media to me is a little poisonous. Um, you know, we, we, I think, and I would do it too. I'm not, I'm not judging anybody. And I think for some people, you know, some people are socially anxious. So, um, and the, the, the reality is I'm, I'm a little antisocial. I don't go out a whole lot when I'm off the road. I can talk to anybody, but, um, you know, I, I just do, I do physical things when I'm home. I, you know, I train for the band and play drums, but then I also, you know, I do some, I'm remodeling a house. Uh, so I do construction work and landscaping and stuff. And, and, um, if I was on social media, I wouldn't get any of that stuff done, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. And, and it's, uh, I see it's, I see it's benefits and I certainly know people that, because of their health and the pandemic, I, I wouldn't want them to go out. And so social media is a good thing for them. They can maintain 
some kind of social contact in that sense. But but for me personally, yeah, it it just I was spending too much time on. I was on Facebook at the time. It was pre Twitter, pre Instagram, you know, um, and so sorry. <laughs> It's all good. It's all hey, good. Is, you know, and we're and we're we're talking if when if and when we get to it again, call me up, man. We'll we'll sit around and have a cup of coffee and just shoot the bowl. I'll do that. I'll do that. Your live set list is a healthy mix of the catalogs. Uh, which of the songs? Uh, that you didn't play on, do you uh, like or dislike the most? Yeah, I really liked, I mean, the energy of Start of War and Behemoth were really fun to me. And, you know, that's those were Nikoshiro drum parts, and they were challenging, but the, they're cool songs. I mean, the whole thing was absolutely fun to play. I mean, the Death Trip stuff, look, Bled for Days was really the first song we ever wrote that started turning the band into Static X. So that song was really written, you know, early 95 was when that song was first written. I played it thousands of times, and it, oddly enough, I feel the exact same way at 54 years old when I play that song that I did when I was 27, 28 years old when it was written. There's just an energy about that song, and it, and it's it's really kind of, for the most part, it's a simplistic song, but it's so layered, you know. There's so much going on in it. Um, I, it just... It, that's a hard question for me to answer. I, I love playing all of it. It appears that everyone in the band, uh, even former members, uh, obviously late members, are credited as, as songwriters. Is, is that the way it's always been like that? Even splits, or at least... Everybody contributes, you know? Um, I don't just think about drums when I'm right, when we're working on stuff. I think about programming and arrangements and, you know, I write lyrics and, and I mean, there's always, and it, it wasn't, uh, well, I need to do this or it needs to be done. It's just, you know, a part of the creative process. Um, so, you know, and, you know, for like, there were three songs that were actually demoed, um, during the start of war era, which I wasn't involved with, with, but, you know, we took those songs and w they're totally redone. But the fact of the matter is those songs were actually demoed with, you know, the other guys. Well, um, they need to be credited for that. You know, there's, it, it didn't matter that we took them and went in a different direction with them. It's, it's just, it's something that legally, it's kind of, legally it's questionable if you have to do it, but morally I, I think that you should, you know, <laughs> is, is the way to put it. I think that, you know, morally, um, and those two things aren't necessarily, you know, in certain aspects of the laws. I mean, you know, they're, man, I'm getting into a, a deep uh, philosophical question here. <laughs> I think I blew the answer. But I, I, the reality is, is just, you know, those guys were around when the song was written. The songs were written originally. And, um Again, even though, you know, they physically didn't record anything and the songs are totally different, the original concepts were came, uh, were conceptualized when they were there. So take care of them. Yeah. It's part of the, the creative vision of a, of a band, not just this band, but any band. But I, I think it's one of those things, you know, I like – working on drum parts, but I tend to think about songs and lyrics and arrangements first and, and programming. Uh, you know, what Koichi can do is absolutely fascinating to me. 
Um, I know Tony thinks about other things. You know, he just, he's not just the bass player. Um, that was, you know, that's what makes this band work. We we fit together in such a, an unusual way that it's it's not really a, a me first. I didn't. <laughs> I didn't care about personal glory as a drum from a drummer standpoint. I cared about doing what was important for the songs and for being there, for being the foundation for the band so that they could do, you know, Tony Koichi and Wayne and now zero are such visually striking people to watch that I'm not going to overshadow them from, and, and they're such fantastic players that um, the best thing I could do was just, you know, lay down my part and, and be solid and and just be there for them. And, and uh, I like that aspect. There's a discipline to it that appeals to me, I guess. Um, and the weird thing about it is I, I feel... I feel like it's paid off and it's been very satisfactory for me, you know. Um, that being said, I mean, I'm fascinated with drummers that just modern metal drummers. My gosh, those guys, they're almost like jazz players, just how fluid and smooth and how they view everything. That is just an absolutely incredible way to play. I mean, I just, I'm fascinated, fascinated by their techniques and and everything. They they just apply everything they've ever learned to their playing, and and it's it's really a testament to the the discipline that they have. Some of the death metal drummers just are fascinating. I mean, they're really fascinating. But yeah, there's almost if you watch their technique from a from a a drummer's aspect, you, it's almost like, wow, I see a lot of jazz in there. I see Wackel and Vinny Kaliuta, Jojo Meyer, and Benny Grab, and, and and guys that are playing, you know, 280 beats per minute. You know, there's just uh, the technique is still the same. It's really an incredible thing. That's the teacher in me talking. That's that was. <laughs> You know, because I would get kids that would come in that were beginners that are like, you know, teach me how to play Slipknot or teach me how to play what was a five finger death punch and Sabaton, you know, and some pretty heavy duty double kick stuff. And and I'm like, okay, I'm going to teach you how to play this kind of jazz thing, but it applies. And, you know, it was, it was a, unusual way to teach it kept me on my you know it kept me thinking and it kept me challenged and it also you know made me go and listen to a lot of a lot of jazz and a lot of i mean dave leckle went back at what 50 45 50 years old and taught himself how to play double stroke roles in a totally different way just because he wanted to improve his form. There is something to be said about that. Dave Weckle doesn't have to prove anything to anybody, and his form was was <laughs> fairly good, you know. Weckle knows what he's doing. Um, I, I admire that. I respect that, you know. Um, Mike Mangini just freaks me out how much – of jazz techniques he applies to dream theater stuff. It's just really incredible. Yeah, there's so many great, amazing musicians and so much great music to listen to. Where And obviously, thanks to the internet, so much of it at our disposal at any given time. It's uh, overwhelming, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it, it certainly can be. I can find myself going down drum solo threads i've ne- I've never been a guy personally uh, that was like well i've got to do a drum solo you know um i did that early on in my career when i was in cover bands and eventually got to the point where it was like well you know i saw a couple of rock drummers for bigger bands and 
they their drum solos were really good, but then you eventually learn it's really a break for the other guys in the band. They're going backstage and, you know, getting a drink and having a smoke or doing whatever. And um, while these drummers were really good technique wise, they weren't, there wasn't anything, they weren't necessarily setting the world on fire. And this was in the late eighties and early nineties. And that, so that changed my mind about drum solos, you know, um, and, but now, you know, I, I think drumming has become so much more visual, too, that, um, you know, drum solos are incredibly interesting. Um, for me, I would I would want the uh, 30-foot high Peter Chris levitating <laughs> drum riser, but that's just me. Any final thoughts that you'd like to share with anybody that might be listening to this? Well, let's just say, you know, if... If we were total, if it was a totally normal planet, that'd be a little boring. So let's uh, let's view this as a as an opportunity. Um, let's do take care of each other, stay safe, and hopefully we'll get to see you soon.